Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We are a little bit behind um, because of some of our presentations, but I think we'll all agree that they were well worth it. Some very informative stuff from uh, Mr. Wellington, um, somebody that I, I deeply appreciate. Um, as a matter of fact, so much so that when I attended ETS last year, I couldn't even speak when I got next to him. We got into the same elevator and I literally backed myself up into a corner and froze <laughs> because I couldn't believe that I was in the, in the same elevator as uh, the, the ones overseer of FERC, which just kind of gives you an idea of the kind of nerd I am. Um, my name is Dorothy Davis uh, Ballard, now recently married. I am the content director and editor in chief for Penn Energy, which is a brand underneath Penwell Corporation in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I have the privilege of leading today's uh, discussion, which is workforce of the future. Um, so joining me here today, starting on my right, is Dr. Stan McCullen. He is the director of the Ingram School of Engineering at Texas State University, where he researches topics such as the Internet of Things and the Smart Grid. Before joining Texas State, he held technical executive positions at companies such as Xenix Networks, Hewlett Packard, Compact, and General Dynamics. Most recently, McCullen was co-founder co and CTO at a startup company developing a revolutionary communication technology for smart grids. So please welcome Dr. McClellan. And then finally, of course, I have uh, Dr. Masood Amin. He's regarded as the father of the smart grid. Dr. Amin is the director and technological leadership of the Technological Leadership Institute at the University of Minnesota and a distinguished teacher part, teaching professor at electrical and computing engineering within the university's college. Um, he's also the ETS, the, the inaugural ETS Thought Leader of the Year. And uh, Dr. Means worked with over 150 different stakeholders at 70 plus public and private um, organizations to assess the needs and develop effective early education undergraduate and graduate for human capital development initiatives in the energy and technology space. So if we can please welcome Dr. Amin. So once again, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, this is going to be more of a casual conversation. I'm going to direct some questions and give an overview of how things stand. At the beginning of ETS, uh, pre-conference, we had some very enlightening sessions, um, the, the EDU sessions, which brought to fore quite a bit of uh, concerns and, and areas of interest affecting the energy and the technology space. Um, Dr. McClellan was there and was uh, gracious enough to present us with some of his ideas and thoughts. And one of the things he did was he brought forth um, sort of a, a collaborative thought bubble <laughs> that he put onto a board for us to look at. And it really kind of brought home the scope of the issue of incoming workforce and, and human capital and education concerning the, ener the energy space. So I kind of want to continue that conversation, but specifically in the realm of addressing the differences that exist now between the current and exiting workforce and the incoming workforce. So specifically, um, th what I want to point out is that just recently, according to Pew Research, millennials have officially overtaken baby boomers in size in the United States. What this means is that in the workforce, in money and capital, where they're going to be spending their money, in culture and in technology is all going to be influenced by what is now the largest generation within the United States. On top of that, currently, within the energy space itself, we're looking at leadership, which is approaching either retirement within the next two years or within the next decade which is leaving our industry in a position where more than half of their leadership is exiting, just as this new group is entering, creating not only a skills gap, but a tremendous gap in leadership and a tremendous disconnect in culture. I think it's fair to say that the majority of us that are currently engaged in the energy and technology space are what could be defined as digital immigrants. Whereas millennials who are coming into the workforce or being groomed for the workforce are those who are digital natives. Meaning that we may not have grown up with an internet or an internet as prolific as it is now, but this is a generation that is coming into a work area and a space and from a culture where they're constantly connected. So beginning from that place, I, I guess my first question to you gentlemen would be, what do you think the biggest impact of this incoming 
of digital natives is going to be on the industry. We have had considerable number of participants in focus groups, from uh, high school kids to undergraduates to full-time working professionals and to executives on the need and efficacy of uh, adding one more degree to, in my institute. We are the oldest 28-year-old uh, uh, institute for Master of Science in Management of Technology. Think of it as an executive MBA for high tech the first one in the country. And uh, we have a Master of Science within the security technologies area that I had the privilege of creating six years ago, and one in medical device innovation two years ago. Last one, and these are all in the pipeline for about eight to 10 years, building the needs assessment and so on. And the need in this area has changed considerably from the time that we did undergraduate or graduate school, and it was only limited really to either engineers or scientists who are taking power sequences, taking courses on transmission and distribution and on machinery generation, or taking it, let's say, going to the Humphrey School and taking policy courses on energy policy. It was so centralized, if you will, deep expertise across many disciplines. Mm -hmm. We have seen more and more need, and that's how we structure all of our programs. What I call a T model, or a mathematical symbol pi, have a broad understanding that gives you the 360 of policy, business side, leadership, management, negotiation, all of that, and develop depth in one or two areas, specialization in one or two areas. And based on the millennials, that is a lot more appealing to them at a master's level, at a master's. Mm -hmm. At an undergraduate level, I mentioned it yesterday that although uh, power sequence courses are not required, they're just electives at the University of Minnesota in my home department, out of 120 seniors, 117 to 119 of them take it. Mm -hmm. Why? It's because of exactly the digitization, ability to actually build things, simulate them, in Simulink, in MATLAB, there are so many tools that we are using. And put economics and emissions, and also looking at what if policy changes, putting some of those questions early on. Right. And I have had the privilege of working from eighth graders to 12th graders with high schools and junior highs. And same, they are very practical. I prepare them to go for international scientific, uh, they call them uh, scientific innovation Olympiads. Yeah. And they do extremely well. They win, typically, they win majority of them gold. If, and I do it pro bono as a volunteer. So it works. And the kids are amazing. On a BlackBerry, they developed a, one of them developed a piezoelectric that as you touched it, it would charge the electric, uh, the lithium ion battery in it. It's more than, and she had collected the data on 14 year old girl. <laughs> Right. And you know, Flappy she was using, only <laughs> reason, exactly, she was using a BlackBerry and not other phones, but because she could reach, for <laughs> over six months, she hadn't even charged her telephone. I mean, imagine from that all the way to the whole system. So we are ready to, uh, to innovate, and I'm very optimistic about more digitally savvy kids at all levels, all the way to executive training. Many of the executives and some of the lack of leadership in some sectors of our industry is because many, many executives don't have time to read, don't have time to think, actually. So they're putting fires out or delegating it to others, developing them for this new energy change that we are all witnessing. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that uh, at the master's level, a cross-cutting degree <clears throat> that spans a lot of different disciplines makes a lot of sense. Uh, in fact, at Texas State, we're rolling out such a degree this, this fall where it's uh, by nature interdisciplinary and the students are forced to take different things out of different areas, including management and different level areas of technology that they may not touch otherwise uh, with the concept of some depth in a particular specialization. Yeah. So you have this concept of, of people that go out into the workforce after they've finished this graduate work with uh, an anchor in a specialization area. Uh, it could be two specializations area, but they have an anchor in a specialization area, but they also have a view of all of these different uh, 
types of fields that in a normal academic environment they would not get because normal academic environments are heavily stovepiped. I think at the master's level that makes a lot of sense. I think at the undergraduate level though, uh, that doesn't make sense. I think at the undergraduate level there's still a level of uh, Depth, uh, depth that has to be driven in yeah. first. Absolutely, you have to you have to plant that seed yeah. very deep. At Absolutely, the and level. to be clear, my comments were for graduate, undergraduate. We start at a freshman seminar. We get them engaged on projects. I mean, we created an efficiency police. Undergraduate kids going to buildings, assessing, mm -hmm. changing that. So those are extracurricular activities. So they're projects. So to be clear, this is not saying. That, that we are doing one size fit all. We have programs all the way from eighth grade to CTOs and CEOs of companies, the whole range. And, and that kind of that kind of leads me into one of my next questions, or what I was thinking about. You were talking about this this, this police group that comes in for the undergraduates. How do you retain the attention of people who are constantly engaged or or digitized? I mean, it's it's. When you enter into a college situation, it's very, very different. Um, the, like you said, the amount of depth and study that is required, mm -hmm. especially for um, fields like engineering or um, even chemistries or, or, or electronics, you have to be committed. And there's a lot of turnover after that first or second year mm -hmm. where we're losing a lot of undergraduates. So mm -hmm. that's another aspect of this story where we're trying to get people in. But once we're, OK, let's say we've sold them in middle school. They're excited about energy. They're going to go ahead and pursue it. How do we get people who are then taking a less siloed approach in their graduate program to then invest the time to mentor these undergraduates and keep them engaged and interested? What, what ideas would the two of you suggest within either your own programs or ones that you've seen to keep to retain this, this future workforce? I think the concept of the flipped classroom tends to work pretty well with millennials. Um, they, they like to do things on their own, they like to engage on their own, and one of the things that I've also found is even though they've got their face in their smartphone, they're listening. Yeah. Uh, they have an amazing ability to multitask and pick things up peripherally. Um, even though uh, with some types of subjects they need to work their way out of that, uh, that seems to happen naturally as they get engaged and as they get interested. The smartphone goes down, the pencil comes up, but even when the smartphone is up, they have an ability that I'm going to say us gray hairs didn't have. Oh, I don't have uh, that. You know, as <laughs> non-digital natives, I didn't have when I was younger uh, and have had to fight to develop over the years. And these kids come in and they already are able to pick up things uh, in a multi-sensory way. We do the same. We do flip classroom, uh, form small groups of three. Actually, we mix it so that if you're friends with somebody, you can be, but we prefer to have different backgrounds together in that team. And we don't lecture them. We are mostly like orchestra conductors. <laughs> we just ask the right questions, and they figure it out. And at the same time, uh, they learn. We develop internships for them. We get them engaged. We bring executives. Actually, all of our inductors in my institute are former vice presidents from 3M, from uh, companies like Yahoo, Ecolab, or government leaders, senators, and so on, that are a faculty in my institute. So we make sure. The attorneys, policy, business executives, and scientific CTOs, CEOs are our faculty who are teaching them. Just that, brings up, that brings oh, up a great point. Uh, investment by industry in the higher education realm, I think, is getting, it has gotten more critical lately. Uh, as, as state and federal funding sources dry up, and as we face this pending problem, uh, particularly in the energy industry with people leaving mm -hmm. for age reasons and for other reasons, uh, the, the interface into higher education and to K-12 by people in this industry, I think is absolutely critical. Um, there's got to be a more proactive approach uh, from the industry into the educational organizations uh, to help train those people up. Cooperative education is a great mechanism. Internships, a great mechanism. But I think it needs to go beyond that because we've had cooperative education and internships for many, many years, and they're, they're fantastic. Uh, but I think what we need is we need a deeper penetration by industry into the educational establishment to help formulate better priorities. You know, we are, my institute is very different from your traditional academic institute. By design, 
We are interdisciplinary. We cut across eight colleges at the University of Minnesota, from the law school, Walter Mondale School of Law, Hubert Humphrey School for Public Policy, Carlson School of Management, College of Science and Engineering, Public Health. We pick creme de la creme of senior faculty with industry or government experience to come and teach. And in-house, we have seven endowed chairs who are amazing, who are all former executives and so on. So we are by design interdisciplinary, and that's hard for departments to do. Mm -hmm. So in a traditional mm -hmm. department, the, the focus is depth in that field, which should be, by mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. That's why you create, and the concept of interdisciplinary centers is not new, goes back actually to the 1970s and 80s. The only part is typically you're self-supporting, and you have to always think how to innovate. As part of that innovation, you think, how do I engage the best and brightest and connect them to the training, capability building, workforce development that connects to industry and public sector. And that's the connection. Also, our alum, they get, uh, many of them are always, are already working, the ones who are doing masters or doctorate. However, the ones who are undergraduate, they get multiple offers. Why? Because we always bring industry in, exactly what you mentioned, in every aspect. We bring government in, pick their brain, at the national level, at the local level, at the regional level. Uh, so that's very hard to do in traditional departments or in traditional colleges. Right. So uh, the model that has been successful but takes a unique set of funding and attributes to be successful. We were lucky Honeywell Foundation 28 years ago felt mm -hmm. there is a need to do this and created four endowed professorships. Yeah, I think that's a critical concept right there. Uh, mm -hmm. Endowed professorships, we call them professors of practice, mm -hmm. people that maybe have deep industry credentials that are not no, it's uh, different, conventional actually. academics. It's different. Okay. A professor uh, of practice is something. Professor else. of practice is, uh, endowed professor of practice yeah. could be a really useful way for industries to interact with uh, academic centers or academic departments because that way they get on the inside of the academic process rather than being on the outside or throwing things across the fence. Yeah. So one of the things that came forward during that initial EDU session was just that idea of industry presence, uh, going mm -hmm. all the way back to the K through 12 area. And one thing that was put out there was that um, within the energy space, there seems to be a lot of presence from the oil and gas industry, but not as deep a presence um, from the electric utility or just electric distribution or even now these, these side startups that are coming up or these individual IPOs, they're not as present. Not that they're not present, but they're not as present and they're not as engaged. What do you think is the disconnect there? Because clearly everybody is, is lacking talent now. They're, they're looking where the oil and gas industry, just as much as the power industry, is in need of new people and new talent and definitely cultivating new leadership. What do you think is the disconnect there? What do you think is happening between the two industries where one is recognizing a need for investment and one is not? I think uh, maybe from about 15 years ago or so, the electric power field was seen in many respects by the students as a solved problem. It was not, uh, it was not a sexy career choice and you saw a lot of people move away from that and move into more uh, other types of things that they thought were more interesting. Um, and I think uh, that perspective has been has changed now with this concept of the smart grid. We've seen mm -hmm. a, we've seen something happen in the electric power industry with a, a, a flipping of the technologies, very much very similar to what we saw happen in the telecommunications industry about 15 years ago, where it changed from being a, a voice network with a little bit of data to a data network with a little bit of voice. Mm -hmm. It's changed now from being a power network with a little bit of communications to a communications network mm -hmm. that happens to also supply power. And I think I think those two paradigm shifts. Uh, very closely mirror each other and for about 15, 20 years the power industry until we had this concept of the smart grid which is uh, uh, older than it seems but a relatively recent phenomenon right. um, people were exiting the area because it just seemed like a solved problem. I echo that. We had as undergraduate I remember in the basement of engineering building east at University of Massachusetts Amherst we had electric machinery classes 13 people in that course. In contrast, controls, signal processing, we had 100, 120, mm -hmm. 140. VLSI that year had much more than that. So mm -hmm. it wasn't sexy. 
Right. Power wasn't sexy. That, those fundamentals, by the way, rotating machinery, same uh, physics-based training we had is critical. Right. But it's necessary, but it's not sufficient anymore. That is very good if you're going to focus on machines. And machines have huge potential or transmission and distribution. Uh, so it opens up, if you will, it democratizes to a much wider audience that historically may not have been in physics or engineering or science or mathematics, may have been in humanities, social sciences, opens the door for them to actually become a participant in it. The same disruption that you saw with the advent of, let's say, um, uh, the, the heart, you know, the low, um, what is it called? The, the one that... Pacemaker? Pa not pacemaker, which is Earl Bakken, but the other tube that you open up the veins, it Stand. enables... Yeah. Stent, yeah. thank you. Drug-releasing stent. You see, I'm having a senior moment, even though <laughs> I'm not even close to being a senior. <laughs> so, so with that, you open up a whole area to reduce the cost for many to do the surgery. They don't need bypass anymore, mm. open heart surgery. And you enable cardiologists who historically were not doing that type of sophisticated surgery to get into it. Same phenomena, same disruption is happening in training of a capable workforce that can handle the complexities that are no longer just engineering or no longer just law or business, but it's all of the above. And that exciting part, ability for digital generation, millennials, to actually simulate it, to do what-if analysis from early on. What if I stop that generator? The what if I change the pricing of carbon? What if I change, how does the system work? So ability to really make it very pragmatic for them, rather than when I was undergraduate in 81, 82, we, had, we didn't have that tool. I mean, we had to do the derivations mm -hmm. on a paper and then go to a computer, huge IBM computer, program it, and thank goodness, I missed the part that you had to carry the... the punch card. Uh, punch exactly. Card. <laughs> so, so that was the year I went to, freshman year, that had been discontinued. Otherwise, or before the slide rule. I mean, we have come a long way, and actually I'm excited, a lot more we can do in that area. So I think what you said is right on target, that, that we have not only broadening the areas that many more students at all levels can get into it, but they can actually get great jobs in that area. Now I temper that by saying that is industry ready to absorb and have careers in those areas? Undergraduate, yes, I took three sequences, power systems, control systems, signal processing. I went the controls route, why? Jobs in power were not as sexy. Mm -hmm. 13 people in the first course, nine in the second course of power, in contrast to signal processing controls. And eventually I worked a lot on defense from 82 to 97. When I moved to EPRI in 98, January of 98, I took everything I had learned from defense, battlefield, overlay of sense or situation, and applied it to the electric power grid. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting because now I'm not sure in, if industry as a larger sector is able or is ready to absorb the influx of the talent that will be headed their way. Mm -hmm. I think it's very interesting because um, we kind of are at a, a crossroads, as it were, where we have a lot of important things kind of converging at once. So we have this incoming workforce of digital natives, but we also have this in tremendous disruptive shift that's happening within the en energy industry. So one kind of complements the other. As far as power being sexy, it is very sexy now for millennials for a lot of reasons. There's lots of technology, there's new research to be done, but also from an environmental standpoint, mm -hmm. these are the children of, p of activists. And right. a lot of them are very- There's a motivation. There there's is a motivation a strong, that wasn't there before. There's a strong motivation. So there's, yeah. a, there's a deep passion, which over and over again, it's, it's been, um, in research that's been done on the millennial generation, it's been noted that they have to feel that they're doing something of worth right. to be a part of a company or to, to have buy into a specific career. So I think it's interesting that that's happening. Um, I'm a little concerned that industry isn't jumping on board to kind of meet uh, millennials um, as this is happening. Like you said, I don't know that uh, we're necessarily prepared to welcome this, this new wave of talent in. 
Um, but I think we need to start hurrying up and getting prepared and maybe starting a little bit younger. There's been a lot of talk about uh, kind of uh, graduate and postgraduate, um, but really uh, my, my, I have a nine-year-old at home and she frequently gets books from the oil and gas industry because I live in mm -hmm. Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So um, everything from coloring books to little activity charts, there isn't one from our local utility provider. Not mm -hmm. one. Yeah. And the only time electricity is spoken about is if I go and I bore everybody with it. And I'm not nearly as informed. So again, um, I, it, it's just I'm sensing or I'm seeing a pattern of disconnect where the power industry is concerned versus all of these disruptive things well, that I think, are happening. I think the power industry is not going to have a lot of choice. Um, I think we're, we're, we're at an inflection point that's the second generation of the internet, right? It was the internet of people and the internet of business. Now it's the internet of things and the internet mm -hmm. of machines. Mm -hmm. uh, this will be adopted by the power network. It already has been to min in many respects. And, the, and the, the digital natives already think like that. They already have that basic understanding, and so that will be that will happen, yeah. whether it's uh, desired or not. Or not. Yeah. Also, uh, I agree wholeheartedly. It's not just the utilities. Imagine also the vendors, the manufacturing mm -hmm. force, the consultants, the contractors. They are absorbing a lot of the high quality, or they are welcoming. So this transformation, this change, this evolution. It's going to happen. And it's right. a gigantic so ecosystem, so it takes a global. while for it to soak it's in. It's global, yeah, by the right. way. And, and jobs yeah. are global. I've had students, brilliant, who have made the solar lantern, this is about 15, 12 years ago. Solar lantern, and at a cost of $1 a month, he took it to villages in, uh, back in Nicaragua. And he's uh, born in St. Paul, Minnesota, but it was in, in his heart. I'm going to do this. Double E, work as an undergraduate, built that, commercialized it. Then he manufactured it in China. He went to China, actually mm -hmm. scaled it up, and it's still there, by the way. And then came back to Minnesota uh, to, you know, and it's amazing to see that. Last week, he was the co-chair of the, uh, an Internet of Think Fuse, a big, huge event at the University of Minnesota, this young guy. Mm -hmm. That's the generation I'm excited by. So they, they've also grown up in an era in, a, in an environment uh, of of sharing, yeah. and it's sharing in a very different way than many of the than many of the established business people uh, have been familiar with. Yeah. Uh, we saw this in one of the sessions here the other day, where it was a, a session about open source, and mm -hmm. the 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 four participants in the session about open source had gray hair, and and their perspective on open source was. Mm, that gets in the way of my business model. Intellectual property. And, and, and yeah. yeah, and and the, and the millennials see it completely the opposite yeah. way. Yeah. They share the code. Mm -hmm. They're more interested in learning about the yeah. thing from somebody else who's willing to share the code and then share the code back. Uh, whereas uh, that's a completely in opposition to the standard business model. Okay. And 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 these guys that have grown up in this industry haven't gotten their brains around that concept yet. Well, like you said, it's coming, so it, 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 they're going to have to, they're going to have to, but... Um, we got to change ourselves, actually, yeah. and our ecosystem is changing. You know what happens? We become relics if we don't <laughs> adopt that change. That's right. Um, we have just a few minutes left. This is really a topic that deserves its, uh, probably its own space, day, and time. Um, as you mentioned in, in uh, Tuesday sessions, there are a lot of shuns that uh, <laughs> kind of get grouped into this and I think we the most important one is integration. Right, I, I agree, I agree. And I, I agree that the incoming workforce is very much of that collaborative and integrative mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a generation that's functioned on freewares and sharewares and so um, they're ready and willing and they have the technology to do it, to share instantly and to collaborate instantly. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna open it up to the audience for some questions. Um, we'll take a couple, and then after that, if you two gentlemen would just like to give some a closing point, uh, maybe a finishing thought on today's discussion, I'd appreciate it. So, do we have any questions? Um, my name is Kathy Redson. I'm a solar integrator here in Austin, and I also have a, a co company. I've been in the solar training space for since 2008, um, and if we had we're at this conference maybe three or four years ago. If I looked at the program and it said workforce development, we'd be talking about you know NABCEP certification and jobs and the solar industry and solar installers and and 
especially because, you know, when I look across, I was also taught high school for, for 10 years in Miami-Dade County, Florida. And, um, you know, for just as many students as you work with at the university level, there are a whole lot of other students that aren't necessarily interested in, in a college education, and, and, and yet they're super qualified to do the kind of work that we need, especially in the solar industry, installing panels, mm. um, and even solar, you know, sales, dealing with commercial businesses and, and homeowners and, and this, this sort of thing. Uh, I actually designed a, like a career cluster for solar training that would be infused with other academic areas to a STEM academy. And, um, but it just seems like the wind has been taken out of the sales and workforce development lately um, with respect to just really, I mean, as an integrator, I've been in the training space for five years. I can't find tr tr people with any knowledge at all that coming out of either colleges or even community colleges, mm -hmm. you know, with solar, solar backgrounds, understanding just basic power, you know, AC, DC circuits. There's a program here at ACC, but it's very under-enrolled. Um, where do you see the training going in really hands-on, you know, uh, practical, you know, you talked about co-op education and apprenticeships to get, you know, the broader workforce retooled into some of these jobs that are just working with your hands and, yeah. you know, learning about basic construction trades and to be able to do some of the work that's needed to transform our housing stock and our commercial building stock and move us into this grid that we talk about. I mean, it's a huge, daunting task. Right. There so, are, there's so no where, pathway for where, that. Where is our green workforce? How do we get there? <laughs> well, there's a, there's a large ecosystem of educational providers from like places like Gary Job Corps to community college districts to universities as well as other places for people to find training in, specific, in task specific activities. Um, it disturbs me that you say that there's a program at ACC that's under enrolled and it had to do with DC and AC circuits. That's a little di bit disturbing, but there's probably an explanation for that because electrical engineering is counterintuitive in many respects and people like to do things that they can natively understand. Yeah. And a lot of what happens in electrical engineering is all imagined and it, it, there's a barrier to entry. So um, yeah. things that, uh, things that have to do with technologies like that may be explained by people migrating towards the robots, which they can understand, and towards the mechanical engineering aspects, mm -hmm. which they can manipulate themselves. I agree. That has been the case for many, many years, that typically a lot of students, the peak university enrollment for electrical engineering was in 1983 or 84, exactly when I went to college. But even then, the same phenomena would happen. Really bright kids, men and women, start, but it was too abstract for them. Mm -hmm. It was too mathematical, because even though in high school they had had calculus, high school calculus was insufficient for them to understand it. High school physics, even AP physics, they had gotten four out of five maybe, wasn't sufficient. I think it goes back, that's why we start earlier. We start at eighth grade. Because we do well as a nation when we look at World Economic Forum report, we do very well until fourth or fifth grade. And then we start falling down. And we don't do it all in my institute. We partner with community colleges, with technical colleges. We, co we have a course on cybersecurity. We partner with the metropolitan state. That it's co-taught, which is unheard of. I mean, I created that because of personal connection to the faculty over there that I knew them. And I said, how about we do this together? Each of us have 10 to 20 people, but maximum 30 people in the cybersecurity class. They do forensics. Ours is a master of science in security that you can specialize cyber, food security, works. We knew some of it is very hands-on, and we do a lot of theory, typically in our computer science or mathematics or other areas. So such partnerships. We need to, in a sense, check our ego at the door and mm -hmm. think we are all in this together. We may have come on different ships, but we are on the same boat. We need the whole supply chain, whole talent pool, and that pipeline for the talent is very leaky. We lose a lot of people during that. How to not mm -hmm. only stop the leaks of that talent pool, but empower them and having partnerships with, with 
industry. At the end of the day, it cannot be, and I'm really a firm believer in role of government, but we cannot depend on government programs to make this program successful. Long term, we need the industry and consultants, utilities as a whole, and builders, home builders, to have a demand for such things. Otherwise, colleges, technical colleges, community colleges, cannot sustain such programs. And, and if I could just speak to your point very quickly, I think you're absolutely right. We really are going to need the private sector to get involved um, for us to, to make the kind of development to move forward the way we need. As far as our larger population um, is concerned, especially in the renewable energy spaces and solar, I really think we need more of industry to step in. So we need more of the same people who are taking the risks and are becoming the startups and are becoming partners in energy to step in and really provide some training and go more non-traditional routes. So um, there's a program in New York City called uh, Non-Traditional Jobs for Women, which is creating a whole space on solar training and solar installation. It does not require a college degree. It just requires some basic understanding of some very, very simple principles on, on uh, electricity and on solar installation. And it gives women a way to empower themselves in a very lucrative career. I think industry outside of just reaching out to millennials needs to look to a broader population, a broader population for our talent pool. Yeah. And, and while we will always need higher engineers and, and great thinkers and great creators, we will always also still need a solid workforce. Mm -hmm. And we have to be more aggressive and letting people know about it. If I don't even have the basic concept of how my energy works or how vital it is, I'm never even going to consider it as a, as a possible career. It wouldn't occur to me that solar installation would be an option. Well, I mean, to well, be frank with you, I mean, giving a woman a 55-pound solar panel to carry from a three-story house ladder onto a slope roof at 45 degrees in, you know, sketch her shoes, uh, tied off from the ridge line. Um, I think it's a great program, but the chance that many <laughs> women are going to be able to handle that kind of a job. You know, we have uh, talked uh, about that. Sorry for the for, sorry to interrupt. We only have two and a half minutes left. <laughs> So, so sorry, no, Madam Moderator. <laughs> we, have, we have dealt with that issue in the military, role of women in the military. We can have women opportunity to have such jobs as they choose and to be rewarding. If it is physically means you have more muscle as a man, should not limit opportunity only to men. So anyway, we can go through this. Um, I'm, I'm going to share with you one thing, quick thing. My former, where I did my doctorate at Washington University, a very distinguished physics professor decided to do a course that he called Applied Physics uh, Practicum. You know what it was? For low-income families, renovating their piping, their electrical, his students, volunteers, would go get certified. Certi and these are folks who were doing PhD in physics, theoretical physics, relativity. And Every summer, they would volunteer, go rewire, repipe homes. And they actually, many of them, I think, eventually ended up working as plumbers. And they may have, because you could make more money in those than rather than in relativity, which is gorgeous, beautiful area. So, so anyway, that's what they did. And it was an applied physics practical. It was, it was not for credit. You didn't pay any money, but it was on your transcript that you had taken a practicum in that area. And actually, I volunteered for it. So you learn by doing. And there is no shame in that. There is no shame. You can, it doesn't mean that we have lower IQ if we do such jobs. We need all of us That's to do this. Yeah. We could do a lot of these creative things together and realizing that it's not about an elitism. Of course, I'm wearing a suit and fancy tie. But it's not about the elitism. It's about empowerment. And it's about progress. And we can achieve that. Let's go ahead and take one more question, please. Would you please wait for the because you are being recorded. Thank you. Me. On the lines of um, hands-on experience, and not everybody, you know, wants to go to college and things like that. You mentioned Gary Job Corps and things like that. Back in my day, and I'll age myself here a bit. You know, you when you went to high school, you had the Voc Tech kids, you had the business 
school kids, you had the college prep kids, you know, there were, there were those different types of uh, tracks in school that you could go to. Like if you, if you knew you either weren't intending to go to college or not, but you wanted to become a mechanic or you wanted to do something, they offered those voc tech type of uh, classes. And in the nation now, I, they've, they've really gone away from all of that. And I think they're looking at maybe starting to bring some of that back. It's not there yet. But since I really the, think since the 70s, the number of people that have gone to college, the percentage of people that try to go to college or go to college has more than doubled. So the college tracks have been emphasized over those. Right. But you know, there are a lot of unemployed college kids out there because there aren't enough jobs to sustain all of that, that graduating type of stuff. And unfortunately, our manufacturing businesses and things like that, because of the global scales and economies and, and the whole political realm with that, they're going overseas, you know? I mean, we have Toyota factories here now and, and things like that are starting to come back. But I think the, uh, there's a whole class out there that we're missing that I think as a nation, we need to start looking at that and say, okay, not everybody is gonna go to college. You know, we have a great need for linemen, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, and we have an ACC program to do linemen and stuff, but we still have a huge deficit when it comes to trying to find qualified young men to come in and that are willing to be linemen. And it's a, and it's a, you know, a breed of its own. You've got to be able to climb those poles. You've got to be able to do a lot of things. And I just yeah. think that our high schools, our education system needs to take more advantage of that. Thank okay. you for your remarks. Yes, thank but you. I will be happy to comment, but given we are short of time, we can talk offline. Yeah, I pre well, thank you everybody for coming today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. Did you have any closing thoughts? Um, before we wrap this up? I think up? at the end of it, uh, it's about culture change, and it's about money, about opportunity, and whether the market demands it, whether the market needs it or not. And a lot of the conversation we are having, we can talk about what is failing, and talk about the past, or we can switch it around, looking at what's working, what are the models that work, and adopt that. Siemens, German, you have known this about it, have a fantastic onboarding and training program, and you choose in high school which direction you want to go. There are so many, I'm not going to take too much time, right. but there are so many positive models that have been successful. Congressman Payne, who is the congressman um, for uh, New Jersey, uh, Newark, New Jersey, when Public Service of New Jersey was proposing an, an amazing progressive pro, uh, project on about $2 billion enhancement of the infrastructure post Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, to upgrade. He was saying that how do we retool the folks that are in Newark, that are living there, to become some of the workforce, and so on. And I agreed. I was one of the people that his, uh, his, uh, his office asked to meet with him, sit with them, sit with two vice presidents, the four of us from PSENG, and discuss that discuss workforce development that's sustainable, long-term, not just once. So you step out of it, you say, how many cities do we have that we could do better? I would say start locally. If you try, I've tried very hard to make a policy shift or a technology shift at the national level. We need to do that, we, but at the same time, that's a long-term process. Locally, we can do more. So start with your own city, with your own neighborhood, with your own city council, and do it in a productive way. Don't do it in a complaining way, rehashing the negative things that, that all of us know in the past. Focus in on an actionable, positive vision that we can upgrade, kind of like what Habitat for Humanity does, or mm. my old physics professor did. Make it very practical. Dr. McClellan? Uh, we have to, someone else needs to come in. Sorry about that. Thank you all today for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. Please thank our panelists.